Matthew chapter 5 is where we will be. It helps you understand um, what I'm talking about. If you have God's word in front of you, open up and you're just following along. And so I will make sure um, I go slow enough. We're only doing three verses here today. Um, we'll go slow enough so to make sure you understand. I want to make sure you understand God's word. In fact, we exist here at Sanger Bible Church to help you love God and love people. And so the way that rolls out is we are committed to helping the believer love God, which means everything that we do here at Sanger Bible, everything that we do, whether it's Sunday services, our connecting events, our life groups, our regeneration groups, our equipping classes, all of this is geared for you to grow in loving God. And so the idea is that we want to come alongside you and grow in your knowledge of the Lord, uh, help you overcome sin issues, provide community and accountability, so a shot, um, iron sharpen irons, and so that the kingdom of God will grow in you, helping you become the best kingdom worker where you live, work, and play, which rolls into loving people. First, we love God, then love people. We are committed to helping the believer Love people. And so what we call that here is kingdom workers. Every believer in Jesus Christ, God has given them work to do. He's given them gifts, things to do out in the world. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for which God has prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. We, you and I, have been gifted by God to do kingdom work. Work. So not only are we committed to helping you grow in, in loving God, we are committing to you to helping you love people to do kingdom work. Now, as, as you go into the community, as you go be the church, as you go and are a kingdom worker, the idea is that we are infiltrating the community and, and transforming the community from the inside out, growing the kingdom in the community and in the valley. And so we're, that's why we don't do stuff here. At, where, where we're creating a little Christian bubble where we have our own school and all this stuff. So people can come to us. The idea is that we would go and be in the community. It's one of the reasons why we're doing the open house. You know, so many people are like, Pete, Sanger Bible should do a float and, and, and go down the, you know, do the parade. I was like, no. Like, I want everybody to go. So you got students in, who's got students here in elementary schools? Each elementary school has a float. Other people have floats. Go, go be part of the community. And then the open house is just because a lot of people are asking questions. What's going on there? Why, why all the construction? The open house is just like, come and see what God's doing here. The church is not a building. And so the idea is that go be part of the, all the communities, all the floats there. And be like, hey, you want a hot dog or anything? That's what we're providing. That's the idea here. And that's what we're trying to do. Remember, Jesus says, go, 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 go make disciples. Go make disciples, and that's what we are trying to do here. We are to go as kingdom workers, further in God's kingdom where we live, work, and play. Now, Jesus here today in Matthew chapter 5 is going to clearly show us, you and I, what it looks like then now to relate to other people. So far, he has said, blessed are the poor in spirit in verse 3. Though, though they are the people who know they, who they are and they need God. He's also said, blessed are those who, are, who mourn. They are the ones who are broken over their sins in verse 4. Blessed are the meek. They are transparent and humble in verse 5. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They seek to live correctly in verse 6. Jesus also says, man, the kingdom is given to you if you recognize your absolute need for God. He also says that, that he will give you comfort when you're devastated over your sins. He says you would inherit the earth when you show humility and transparency. And then he says you will be full if you seek righteousness in verse 6. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? Do you see what Jesus is, is teaching us here? What Jesus is doing is he's, he's in the process of emptying our lives of pride arrogance, self-reliance, and independence. Jesus is ridding us from ourselves. He's saying, guys, if you're going to follow me, there's no room for pride in verse 3. If you're going to follow me, there's no room for fraud in verse 4. 
If you're going to follow me, there's no room for the pretentious in verse 5. There's no room for the conceited in verse 6. Later on, we'll teach on this text, but Jesus says in Matthew 16, he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Essentially, what Jesus has been saying thus far is, you want to be my kingdom? Deny yourself. You want to be a kingdom worker? Pick up your cross. Rid yourself of yourself. Today in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, 8, and 9, it goes from our relationship to God in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 to our relationship with people. Essentially, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 is all about us loving God. And today, verses 7, 8, and 9 is all about us loving people. And so that's what we're going to see today. Have you ever got asked the question, man, God, how do you want us to truly be with our relatives, with our friends, coworkers? Well, Scripture speaks on that everywhere. Today, Jesus is going to be specific on how we are to be. Check out verse 7. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. I hope you are there. No need to look at me. Just look at your scripture. If you're on your phone, or the Niners play later on at 1. Okay, so we'll be out by 1245. So, just kidding. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, this sounds a bit odd. It sounds kind of a, a Hindu karma, kind of like you, 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 the idea of what you sow is what you reap. It, it sounds very similar to that, but it's not. Christians, we Christians do not believe in karma. Okay, I don't have time to get into it, but we do not believe in karma. We can talk, you can take me out to lunch, and I'll explain why later. Okay, but Jesus here says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Meaning, show mercy and you'll be shown mercy. Now, first, to look into this text, what is mercy? Mercy is kindness to all people. Mercy is compassion to the broken. Mercy is sympathy to the needy. It's grace to the undeserved. So really, at the, the core of mercy, it's meeting other people's needs. God showed you and I kindness, Compassion, sympathy, and grace when he sent Jesus here to the earth. You see, you, you and I, we are sinners. We are sinners in, 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 in God's eyes. We deserve God's wrath. We have broken our relationship with God because of our sin. In fact, Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah, we deserve to die. We deserve to die, meaning, meaning when we die, we're done. We go and we spend eternal life apart from God. That's what we deserve. But man, the rest of verse 23 in, in Romans chapter 6, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but, but, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because God is merciful, there's a need. He saw his very own creation in need of a savior. And God was able to meet that need. Is it because he was merciful, because he's kind, because he's compassionate, because he's gracious. God didn't give us what we deserve. God gave us what we needed. His son, Jesus Christ, who took our place on the cross, satisfying God's wrath. Oh, no. So God's mercy, God's kindness, God's compassion and grace is shown through his son, Jesus Christ, meeting our spiritual need. Therefore, we're forgiven when we believe in him. Now, that's, that's the big act of mercy that, Je that Jesus showed us. But he also showed mercy in many different ways. Uh, kindness and compassion. Matthew 9, verse 36. Seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them. And so he sent the disciples to minister to them. Matthew 14, verse 14. And, he went, and when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them. And he healed the sick. Mark chapter 6, verse 34. He saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. And looking at him, the rich young ruler, Jesus felt a compassion and love for him. And he said to him, one thing you lack, go sell everything 
and come and follow me. In Luke 15, when Jesus taught the prodigal son, he told, he, he told when the prodigal son returned back to him, the father ran out and met with him because he felt compassion. He had mercy on him, receiving him back with joy. So based on these, the, the, these acts of Jesus Christ, what's mercy? It's kindness, it's compassion, it's care and action. So how do we show mercy to others? Simple, kindness to all people, compassion to the broken, sympathy to the needy, and grace to the undeserved. Doing exactly what Jesus did here on earth, meeting our needs. Look again at verse seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Remember the word blessed, it means happy, joyful, fortunate. So what Jesus is saying, uh, happy, joy, fortunate, are those who are kind, compassionate, and gracious, for they shall receive mercy. Now, if you caught it earlier, I said that we are to show mercy and then we'll be shown mercy. Is that what this text says? No, I don't think so. You see, later on, again, in Matthew 18, Jesus is going to tell, tell of a parable. He, he's essentially going to say, I'm paraphrasing here, so we, it's, it's like 15 verses. But a man owned, uh, owed his Lord a great sum of money. But the Lord forgave the man all that he owed simply because that man asked for forgiveness. And so the forgiven man then went out to another man and he said, hey, you owe me money. Pay me the money that you owe me. And that second man, he asked for forgiveness and mercy. But the forgiven man didn't give him forgiveness and mercy. And what he did is he threw the second man into debtor's prison. And then Jesus says this to the forgiven man. He says, should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Mercy is what Jesus expected from the forgiven man, yet he doesn't. Church, mercy is what God expects from us to others. Why? Because you and I have been shown great mercy. Because mercy has been shown to us, we show mercy to others. It's not the idea like, hey, I'm only going to give you mercy when you give me mercy. No, it's not that. We've been given mercy, therefore we give mercy. Now, I know you're already thinking about it. Somebody in your mind has already popped up. Some name or names have already popped up. Does this mean I got I to gotta show mercy to the people who are rude to us? What does the text say? Yes. Does this mean I, I got to show mercy to, to, to the jerk, the, the, my next door neighbor? Yes. Does this mean that, that, that even if they don't deserve it, do I, do I got to show mercy to them? Yes. We are to be mercy to all, the rude, the arrogant, those who make fun of us, those who are against us. You know why? Because when we sin, every time we sin, that's what we are doing to God. Yet God still shows mercy to us. 97, I got jumped by a gang because I was a wannabe gang member at the time. And so I, 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 I walked to school and on campus, right when I got on the campus, I got jumped by four guys and nobody stopped anything. Nobody stopped anything. So I get up and then I walk back home and my eyes are busted and my ears like hanging down and I walk in the house and my mom's screaming like she saw like a ghost because her son is covered with blood and everything. And so my dad sees me and he looks and he's like, oh, clean him up. He's going to go back to school. And I'm like, what? I don't go back to school. He was like, no, no, like you're going to go back to school. They're not going to win. And I'm like, okay. So I go back to school. A couple of days later, and uh, just some time, my dad asked, like, hey, like, who's, who's, the, who's the guy that kind of led this out? I was like, oh, dad, it's okay. Like, no, who, who's the guy that led the gang to, to jump you? I was like, oh, it's Joe. He was like, Joe? And I'm like, yeah, Joe. And so Joe was the, the starting uh, uh, running back at the time, and, and I was the newbie and things like that. And so um, it, was, it was just some beef that was happening. And so my dad was like, okay, well, come to find out, uh, eventually my dad took myself to Joe's house. 
Um, and, my, and, and I thought my dad was just going to be like, all right, come on now. We have this thing in, in the Tongan culture called Aima, where, where you, it's make clean, where you, where you allow people to fight and nobody jumps in. And then once it's done, it's done. It's clean. Then it's finished. Whoever wins, wins. And that's it. So I thought, oh, my dad's going to make us fight, you know, get it over and done with. No, he calls him out and my, my dad apologizes. My dad shows him kindness, compassion. He didn't even deserve it. Eventually, Joe and his family started attending church. Eventually, Joe and his mom got baptized. Yeah. Mercy. Kindness. Compassion. He didn't even deserve it. Yet I saw my father show mercy to a kid who let a group of guys beat up his son. To be honest, I'm not even sure if I could do that if somebody touched Troy. That's mercy. So whoever it is that come to mind and be like, you're probably thinking about Pete, man. You don't know this person. God has shown great mercy to you. And here he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Who in your life do you find difficult to show mercy? Who do you find difficult to show mercy? As a believer, you have been shown great mercy. And Jesus wants us to do likewise to everyone else. Check out verse 8. Blessed are the poor, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, remember what, what Jesus is doing here, right? Remember, he's, he's ridding us of our pride and our ego. It's so that we would have purity in our heart. Jesus wants people who follow Jesus, he, people who follow him, he wants everyone that, to, to genuinely follow him. Like he wants people who are devoted to him and only him. He wants us to live a sacrificial life only for him to be pure in heart. Therefore, when we are pure in heart, they shall see God. The word pure means to be empty, clean, guiltless, to be blameless, innocent. And so within the context, it's, it's speaking of our spirituality. How does somebody become pure spiritually? Well, the first step is they place their faith in Jesus Christ. And when we place their faith in Jesus Christ, Christ now takes his Holy Spirit. He, dwell, he puts the Holy Spirit in the person's um, soul, in their body, in their soul. And that Holy Spirit begins to transform them and purifies them to become more like Christ. The word heart refers to the spiritual center of our lives. That's where our, our thoughts, our desires, our sense of purpose, our emotions, our will, our understanding, and where our character reside. And so to be pure in heart, the text is saying it means that we are to be clean, blameless in our thoughts, in our desires, sense of purpose, emotions, our will, and our character. In other words, we're supposed to have pure motives. Just a pure motive. And so what Jesus is saying, blessed, happy, joyful, fortunate, are those who are innocent, blameless, clean in their thoughts, in their desires, sense of purpose, emotions, will, and character. Now there's a lot there. What does that really mean then for us? Here this morning. Well, it's three simple ways. The pure in heart has one audience, and it's God. No one else, only God. It's uncomplicated, it's, it's undivided. The heart, the pure in heart, has one audience, and that is God. Number two, the pure in heart has one desire. And that's to live out God's will. They choose to honor God no matter what. So when they, when they come to a decision and, and here is what the world says and here is what God says, with the pure in heart, they're, like, they're going to see. They're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to honor God. The pure in heart always honors God. No matter what the world says, no matter how hard it is, the pure in heart always, always honors God. God. And then number three, the pure in heart has one goal, and that is to bring glory to God. 
Meaning what we say is to bring glory to God. What we do is bring glory to God. What we think is bring glory to God. What we watch bring glory to God. What we listen to is to bring glory to God. What we wear is to bring glory to God. Our friendships, our homes, our families, the way we parent, everything that we do is to bring glory to God. Paul says in, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. See, if you kind of take a step back and look holistically at the Beatitudes, the pure in heart is transparent about who they are. The poor in spirit, they mourn their sin, they're humble, they seek God, and they're uncompromising in their desire to bring glory to God. Now, in verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in, pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does that mean? Well, it means two things. First, visually. We will see God visually. One day when Jesus returns, I'm hoping he returns when we're alive. Because I want to see this whole like rapture thing, you know. Like I want to see this, how all that happens. But I just, the, when, 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 when Jesus returns, we will see Jesus. Everybody will see Jesus. But only those who are pure in heart will truly see God. Now, the second way is spiritually. When we are pure in heart, we will experience God, his love, his comfort, his peace, his patience. We would experience the fruits of the spirit, which only comes from God. Jesus says here, the pure in heart, and you're blessed one day not one day, I'm sorry, and you will see God. Verse nine, our last verse. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. This verse, you read it, I, I want you to know, this implies there's a war. And there is, there is a spiritual war going on for your heart. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, there is a war going on for your heart. Okay, Satan is coming after your heart. He wants you to follow him, and he wants you to follow him in sin. So the, with humanity, there is a war going on with God. Yet here, the goal and the idea is Christ followers are, are to be peacemakers. Like we are to live, work, and play, and, and, and be peacemakers among the people we live with, among the communities we are in, in the environment that we, that we play with, the community everywhere. We are to be peacemakers. But you're probably thinking about Pete, man. You, you really don't know my people. You really don't know my family. Like there's no way I'm making peace with them. God here calls us to be peacemakers. Which is what really? It's to bring peace into a conflict, into drama. Luke chapter 12, verse 58, Jesus says, when you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him. Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you go, he says, when you go. The idea is Jesus knows that there's going to be drama and conflict in all of our lives. So he says, hey, when you go, make sure, make every effort to make peace. Make every effort to squash it. Make every effort to settle it. Make every effort to bring peace among to, uh, to, to the conflict, to the drama. We are to do everything possible to reconcile the issue. Even if we have to go back once, twice, three times, four times, we are to make every effort to pursue reconciliation. Now, if they reject you, that's on them. If they say no five times, that's on them. Your job is to make every effort, meaning we don't quit. We just figure out different ways. And that's all God requires. Now, at the end of the verse, did you notice it says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Now that is interesting to me. Because what's he mean by that? 
What, what's he mean by that? Is, is, is he saying that, that, that as, as we are peacemakers, that we would be called his children? It seems like it. Like there's no other thing. It seems like it, which means that in order to, to be called his children, we are to carry on the nature of God. And here he's saying, which is being a peacemaker. Now, now think about it for a little bit. Jesus lowered himself here to earth to the point where he went to the cross and died for us, right? He showed us his mercy and he died on the cross for us. And he made peace. The cross, Jesus' work on the cross brought peace between us and God. By his work on the cross, our opposition, we, 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 we were opposed to God, but because of the cross, we were brought into peace with God through Jesus' death on the cross. Do, do you see what he's saying here? And so Jesus, Jesus is pretty much saying, hey, if, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called, I will be calling them the sons of God, my children. What he's saying here, man, if you're willing, if you're willing to call to, to, to be in my kingdom, if you're willing to be a peacemaker, I will call you my son. If you want to be a children of God and receive all that I have, honor due to a son, he's saying here we must be after the nature of a son. What did Jesus ultimately do? Jesus ultimately brought us into peace with God. So that's what God wants us to be. And so peacemakers, the idea is that we, we, we are to be peacemakers where we live, work, and play in our work environments, bring morale to it. But the whole idea of peacemaking is to bring a sinner to the foot of the cross and help them see the God of the universe, helping them bring peace to one another. Helping them have peace with God. That is the ultimate God of peacemakers. That is the ultimate goal of peacemakers. That is that we would bring people to peace, but ultimately peace with God. Do you, do you see that? And when we do, we are called his children. So when my father went to Joe's house and Within the six month span, they came and was baptized, and his mom was baptized. He placed his faith in Christ. That moment, my dad showed the family mercy, God's mercy. And when they placed their faith in Christ, my dad was a peacemaker. He brought them to the foot of Christ. He brought them to see the, the work of Christ on the cross. And when they placed and when they saw Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior died on the cross, they, were made, they made peace with God. That's the ultimate goal. And I sit here and I'm like, man, but Joe didn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve it. There's people in our lives who are like, they, they don't deserve it, Pete. They don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve mercy from me. They're, we, we don't deserve mercy from God. Yet God showed mercy to us, ultimately paying the price on the cross, bringing us to peace with God the Father. When we do that, he will call us his son, his daughter. We will be called his children. Man, I don't know how this lands on you today. But I do know for a fact that we got people in our lives that we need to show mercy to. Spouses, don't, don't elbow your own heart. But seriously, we got people that we need to show mercy to. And as you're, as you're thinking about that, you also got to have, you got to be pure in your heart. Like, are, are you like, yeah, I'm going to show you mercy so they can show you mercy? No, I'm going to show you mercy because my desire, I have one audience, and that's Jesus. 
My goal is to bring glory to you, to, to his name. And so as you show him mercy, that's your desire. But hopefully one day they'll be like, hey, um, why are you so nice to me? I don't deserve it. I'm such a jerk to you. Why are you, why are you so nice to me? And then at that very moment, you get to say, it's because Jesus Christ showed me mercy. And at that moment, you get to walk them through the gospel. Do you see what we're doing here? You see, we believe that as kingdom workers, that when we leave here today, we disperse into Kingsburg, Fresno, Reedley, Sanger. We are going to disperse everywhere. And the idea is that you, in your very locations, will show mercy, be pure in heart, and make peace with folks and bring peace to, to, to Jesus Christ. And they'll see that. And by doing that, the, God, the kingdom of God is going to flourish. We are not here to grow Sanger Bible Church. We are here to grow the kingdom of God. And this is what Jesus says. Be merciful, be pure in heart, and be a peacemaker. And the people that God has placed in your life, he's going to use you to bring them to the throne of God. So take the challenge. Do it. He's with you.